Let's start with prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Our Lady of Fatima, Saint Cyril Methodius. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, I was, uh, because of a few questions I was asked, I think I'm going to modify my remarks and address a few of those things. So I'll be repressing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The first thing to talk about is to ask everybody a question. If you've made your first communion, why are you not yet a saint? It's not a trivial question. If we received communion, we received our Lord, body, blood, soul, and divinity, the most blessed sacrament on the altar. And that is more than sufficient to make each and every one of us a saint and a very great saint. But the reality is, that's very rare to happen. Why? St. Thomas points out, the amount of grace we get at the reception of a sacrament is proportional to our disposition. Our disposition. What is our disposition when we're going to receive Holy Communion? And how can we get more grace? If we're not very disposed, we get very little grace. If we're not disposed at all, like we're in a state of mortal sin, we get no grace. It becomes judgment. But if we're not very disposed, very little grace. The more disposed we are, the more grace we get. What can we do about that? How can we get more grace? You only have so many communions you're going to make in your life, guys. God knows the number. You don't. It's not that many. You want to get all the grace you can from every holy communion. I was mentioned to some of the guys when we were eating lunch. Imagine I invited you over to my house. I said, hey, come on over. Let's have a visit. You come over. I open the front door. say, hey, will you step in here for a minute? I lock you in the broom closet and go about my business. You think, are you serious, Father? I mean, what kind of a welcome is that? What's wrong with you? Let me out of here. But for how many of us, isn't that pretty good analogy for Holy Communion? We profess we're Catholic. We profess we really believe that's the Lord, present, most blessed sacrament the altar. That we really want Him to come and be with us. And then we about break the door down after receiving communion, trying to get out of there. Those are the most precious moments in your life. And even if you have to live a hundred years, and I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy, even if you have to be in this world a hundred years, that's not much time. What are you doing with that time? When they were talking about mental prayer, that's exactly the kind of thing that you want to be doing with that time. You want to have things to talk to our Lord about. In the first place, that you have a holy death. Holy death with the benefit of the sacraments, if it's pleasing to God, but a holy death. That's the most important thing any man will ever do is die. That's why I wear black. It's to remind you of death and judgment. There's a judgment coming for each and every one of us. Are we ready? Are we going to have a holy death? If we want to have a holy death, then we better have holy, holy communions. Because that's the source of eternal life right there. Are we just locking them in a broom closet, so to speak, and going about our business? Are we spending time? He doesn't need anything. He's God. He's got it all. If he's coming to us in holy communion, because he wants to give us things that he knows we need, but we've got to ask for him. That's the condition. If we don't ask. Our Lord says, ask and you shall receive. But if you don't ask... You didn't ask. You should be asking for things. Holy death. You guys that are married, blessings on your wife for holy marriage, for holy death for her, on your kids, on your grandkids, on your godchildren. There's so many things to pray for. Whatever virtue you're working on, that you grow on that. Whatever vice you have to conquer, all those things. St. Teresa of Avila, that great mystic, used to talk about it like she was wrestling with the Lord. She wasn't going to let him go until he gave her everything she wanted. What are we doing? 
So have good holy communions and dispose yourself. How do you do that? With that mental prayer every day. With that mental prayer. So, sacramentally, the way you're going to grow in holiness, there's two rungs to the sacramental ladder. It's a good confession, good communion. Good confession, good communion. Padre Pio used to upbraid his regular penitents if they went more than ten days. What are you doing? It wasn't just forgiven sin when you go to confession. It's giving you strength to fight other things and you're growing in sanctifying grace. He'd upbraid the regular penitents. I think we can agree he knows more about it than we do. How often do you go? Are you making good confessions? Good confessions and then a good communion. Preparing yourself. You're going to Mass. You're going to receive our Lord. I got all these things I got to ask him for. Maybe this is my last communion. If this is my last communion, what am I going to ask him for? To help me keep in the state of grace to my next communion, etc., etc. Then after you've received, he's there as long as he's sacramentally present. And a host that, that's till the species disappears. So you've got 15, maybe 20 minutes. Unless literally there's bombs going off, nothing should pry you off your knees and out of that pew. You should be there. It doesn't matter if there's a stampede leaving the place. Maybe there's a fire. It seems like there oftentimes is. <laughs> but you'd be better off praying. Spend that time on your knees. That's where the man that wants to be holy is going to be. Okay. Other question. And I'll talk uh, quite a bit more detail about that. What if you've had a rough life? You've had a rough life and you've had a conversion. You have these things in the back of your head, you know. There's turmoil. One of the most common causes of inner turmoil is caused by not living in the present. What does that have to do with a rough life? We'll get to that. But in order to have true inner peace, and we can't grow in holiness without inner peace, it might be chaos on the outside. As I said earlier, you want to keep this peace in your heart. The devil fishes in stormy waters, not the Lord. In order to have true inner peace, in order to be stirred up with all kinds of inner turmoil, we have to live in the present. We have to live in the moment God gives us, this present moment. We have to leave the past to his mercy, the future is providence, and live in the present moment. Why? Why do we have to live in this present moment in order to have true inner peace, in order not to be stirred up with inner turmoil? Well, if we don't live in the present moment, then there's either two, cho well, there are two choices. Either in some sense we're living in the past, or in some sense we're living in the future. What does that mean when I say someone's living in the past? Well, we mean someone that mentally looks back at his life and says, Man, if only I'd have done that, or I wished I hadn't done that. I wished I had never done that. My life was so beautiful then. Look how I screwed it up. This kind of thing. In other words, when we say if someone's living in the past, we mean someone who allows himself to be filled with regrets at his past failures, wants to live in his previous glories. What do we mean when we say someone's living in the future? We mean someone that mentally preoccupies himself saying, oh, what if that happens? Oh, no, what if this happens? Ah, what will everyone think then? What am I actually going to do if he does this? In other words, when we talk about someone, we mean someone who's living in the future. We mean he allows himself to be filled with worries and stress over things which not only haven't happened yet, they might never happen. So the man who lives in the past allows himself to be filled with regrets over his past failures or wants to live in his previous glories. The man who lives in the future stresses out and worries about things which haven't even happened. In either case, those guys are living in kind of a, a virtual reality. It, if only had attitude in the case of the man living in the past, or what if attitude in the man living in the future. Those are guaranteed, 100% guaranteed to produce inner turmoil. Even though there's essential differences, and we'll look at those a little more closely in a second, either one of those will produce inner turmoil 100% guaranteed because we're worrying about stuff over which we have absolutely no control. These attitudes hold us in bondage. They prevent us from seeing ourselves clearly in the present, which is the only moment that we live in here and now. The men who have those attitudes are either trapped in the past or in the future, but they're missing here and now. They've got a kind of a bondage. So that's a very uh, quick overview of the problem. It's actually, either of those are actually a result of spiritual wounds. So I want to talk a little bit about spiritual wounds and, and practical aspects of healing from those kind of wounds. Not, and these, this doesn't simply pertain to living in the past or future, but all such wounds for the guys who've had a rough life. Now, with time constraints, I'm only going to touch on a few of the more important uh, 
points, but there'll be enough information for to get a good start on it. Because we all have this, this desire to be healed, to be free of bondage that weighs us down because the human condition can leave us sad or empty or angry, dissatisfied, frustrated, or, or with people, places, things, even with God. There are two basic kinds of wounds, physical and spiritual. When you cut yourself with a knife, it makes a physical wound. The severity of the wound depends on how deep you cut yourself and where you cut yourself. Over time, as the wound heals, pain typically decreases until it's all you got left is a scar. A spiritual wound is analogous to a physical wound. A spiritual wound is a result of a trauma or an event in someone's life that left an impression that can be remembered sometimes and sometimes not. Just a sec. Excuse me. The seriousness of the wound, the depth of a spiritual wound, so to speak, depends on the seriousness of the trauma or event. Uh, these can range, uh, range from such things as self-inflicted wounds resulting from, from sin. And each and every sin actually wounds us. All of them. Each and every sin will wound you. That's one of the things purgatory does. It's called the relics of sin. Is you pay now or pay later. So this healing, if you go on now, it gets you out of purgatory time too. So that's a great motivation too, but don't have time to speak on that. Anyway. The traumas that cause such wounds can range from things like self-inflicted wounds like sin to wounds that have been inflicted upon us, even through no fault of our own, like being violently assaulted, being conceived outside of marriage. And yes, that does, that does leave a wound. But unlike the typical progression of a physical wound from damage to healing to scar, typically a spiritual wound remains present. Why? Because in spite of the fact that cause pain, people typically don't know and understand how to heal from spiritual wounds. But because a wound is a source of a pain, the typical re reaction is to build a barrier around the wound, the spiritual wounds, so they can live with and protect themselves from the pain. Typically, those barriers are expressed in certain forms of behavior, certain personality quirks and faults which serve to protect us from that pain. We might see them expressed as anger, resentment, fear, hatred of certain people or situations, not being able to deal with large crowds of people living in the past or living in the future. It's a brief sit summary. Um, you all know who F Father Charlie Ripperger is. He's got four conferences on his website on healing wounds. It's going to talk about stuff I'm not going to talk about here, but it will give you a lot more details on some of these things. I'm just going to talk about healing. But you can certainly go there, four 45-minute conferences. So living in the past or the future is actually a result of spiritual wounds. When we're hurt, we tend to either live with the regret of our past or sometimes with the anxiety of our future. And one of the effects of these is to leave us with this, with this worry and inability to be in the present. When a man lives with regret of his past, man, you know, I, what a life. You know, and I've brought some interesting converts in. At, a, at one of the funerals of a buddy of mine, uh, you know, so there he was in the coffin, uh, and right there was the Harley. And I had the Mongols at it too, so you, you know, you're, it's, you feel like, well, this must be what St. Boniface, you're spending this a rosary, here's how purgatory, yeah. Explain to an outlaw bike gang how it all works. And they listen. Anyway, when a man lives with regret of his past, in effect he tries to give himself what at some level he thinks he deserves by not forgiving himself for his previous actions. The result is he holds himself in bondage to his past and won't let himself ever forget it. In that condition, he can't heal from the wounds of his past actions, nor can he allow himself to live in the present. And I'm going to give a concrete example here in a minute. At some level, he's punishing himself by saying to himself, if only I would have. If only I had not done that, I wouldn't be in the situation. I wouldn't got hurt, so it's my fault. In fact, he's adopted an attitude that in order to be forgiven or be freed would somehow mean he'd be off the hook for his mistakes, but at some level he really doesn't believe that he deserves to be forgiven or freed for his mistakes. So instead of trusting the mercy of God, instead of trusting that he paid the price, that he forgives us, in effect the man is saying, yes, Lord, you may forgive me, and you may have paid the price, but I got myself into this mess. It was a result of my stupidity, my decision. So this is my hurt, my wound, my problem, so i got to deal with it. But no one can change the past. It is what it is. And no one can save himself. That's why we need a Savior. By holding on to the past, by holding on to his regrets, the man is actually holding on to a wound. And not trusting that the Lord came to make all things new. He needs to face those regrets, accept that mistake, that catastrophe, that decision, that event for what it is. Let go of it and let our Lord and Lady take it. Now, those, sound, those are just words right now. We're going to talk about how to do that in a minute. How is he supposed to do that? Well, he recalls the pain, not necessarily details, but the pain. He wants to acknowledge it. 
And then allow our Lord and Lady to love him as well in this event, this decision. He doesn't ask him to love a sin, but to love the wounded soul, to love the soul that is suffering from that specific hurt, to love him even that specific wound and ask them to help him let go of the past, to let go of that pain and turn it over to him. He needs to beg our Lord and our Lady for the grace to love himself. And he needs to get our Lady involved. Don't make the mistake of not doing that. To love that wounded person that he's been shunning and that he's been so disappointed in. To beg them for the grace to see himself as God sees him and to love himself the way God loves him. Most especially to see himself the way God sees him, love himself the way God loves him in that wounded place and that hurt and that regret that's hanging over his whole life. Those past mistakes have held him in bondage. He needs to beg our Lord and our Lady for the grace to no longer reject himself, truly believe he's loved, even this wound, even in this pain. You know, a really great time to start doing these things is that communion, preparing for communion. If he's faithful to this kind of prayer, and I'm going to give you a little formula, that doesn't, it doesn't matter because you can use your own words, but this will work. If he's faithful to this kind of prayer, he'll begin to start loving himself even in this wound. As that begins to happen, as he starts to lo love himself there, he'll be able to quit holding this past over his own head. He'll be able to quit blaming himself for his rotten life. He'll quit saying, if only I'd done this, if only I'd done that. He'll be able to start saying, I am loved. I am forgiven. Even with a past like mine, I can grow in holiness virtue right now. I'm able to become a saint. My past is past. I'm free. I can be holy. I am loved. I don't have any regrets anymore. It is what it is, but it isn't controlling me anymore. Don't forget, the devil certainly promotes living in the past. Why? Because a guy like that keeps himself in bondage for him. The man who lives in the past doesn't allow himself to grow in holiness. In other words, he's unwittingly cooperating with the devil. Now let's get a concrete example to see what I'm talking about here. Suppose someone's really living in the past because of regrets about being involved in an abortion. That's obviously a completely devastating sin with pretty incredible wounds. How does that man go about praying for healing for such wounds? Maybe it was his own kid he was involved with. Got the girl to the abortion mill. Maybe he took a, a friend of his. It could be any number of things. But the basic idea and the healing is the healing of wounded soul comes about by reaching out in prayer to Our Lady and bringing her, bringing her son into the situation. Healing is going to come from contact with Christ. Healing comes from our wounds coming in contact with his wounds. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole. With his stripes we're healed. So we'll just quickly run through a very easy and fruitful method of doing that. It's really easy to remember. It's just an outline. You can adapt it as needed, okay? So we identify a wound. In this case, involvement in abortion. The first thing, and nothing happens until this happens, is to make an act of the will that we really want to be healed. And we're willing to suffer whatever it takes to be free of this wound. That's critical. The most important thing is to make an act of the will that we really want it to be healed and we're really ready to suffer whatever it takes to be free of this wound. We have to have it in our mind going and it's going to hurt. Think of it like resetting a broken bone, only this broken bone is in your heart. It's going to hurt. But in healing, because the hurt, when you were hurt, when the wound, that was pain going in. In the healing, it's pain going out. So it's a different kind of thing. The most important thing is to make an act of the will. We really want it healed. We're willing to suffer whatever it takes to be free of this wound, and we've got to make up our minds can hurt. Now, I want to encourage you here. This pain, this pain of healing, can really put, be put to good use. I'll just tell one small anecdote in that regard before we go on. Yvonne Beauvais, she was later known as uh, Mother Yvonne and me of Jesus, was one of the most remarkable women of the last century. She's a mystic and a victim soul, among other things, was given the mission to make reparation for sacrileges committed against the Blessed Sacrament. So she's a 24-year-old woman waiting to be accepted in the convent when on August 10, 1925, she's ambushed and kidnapped by three men. They beat her. They tortured her, even to the point of pushing long lit knitting needles through her breasts. One of the men torturing was actually a depraved priest whom she had pre previously tried to help, 
by delivering a message, a warning to him from the Lord. After beating her and torturing her, that priest raped her. Then she was tossed out blindfolded on a desert street in Paris. She's been kidnapped, beaten, tortured, raped by a priest, tossed on an empty street. She's waiting to enter religious life, but now she doesn't know if she's pregnant or not. She doesn't know what's going to become of her, of her vocation, of her life. In her journals, she wrote, quote, Jesus shows the heaviest cross, the most humiliating. I severed atrociously in all parts of my body, in every fiber of my heart and my soul. Close quotes. But the most beautiful entry is her simple statement. Quote, After this trial, I obtained that same year the ransom of 32 souls of priests of danger. The pain didn't go to waste. With all that trauma, beating, torture, rape, she obtained the ransom of 32 souls of priests in danger. And what became of the reprobate peace that raped her? Did she pay the price? Later he repented, converted. Pain didn't go to waste. Look, when you're talking about healing, healing serious wounds, it is going to hurt. But it's doable. And it doesn't have to go to waste. And if you offer it up, it won't. And if you're really having trouble, you could certainly pray to Mother Yvonne and me of Jesus to help here, because she will. She's been there. So we've identified a wound, the involvement in abortion. We make an act of the will that we want this to be healed, and we're willing to suffer whatever it takes to be free of this wound. We have in our mind it's going to hurt. It hurts because pain is being released and going out, whereas in wounding, pain is going in. So then what do we do? We turn to Our Lady. We say prayers along these lines. This is great to do before you go to communion. Blessed Mother of God, I completely open to thee this wound of living in the past with all my regrets about the abortion. Then we ask Our Lady, I beg thee to wash, cleanse, and purify this wound with thy tears and precious blood of thy Son. At communion we say, I beg thee to bring thy Son into this wound and to heal it. Have her bring the, her Son in. She'll be much gentler than you will be. And then we ask her, I beg thee to fill this spot with charity and together with thy son to stay and rule. Okay? Walk back through that again. Blessed Mother of God, I completely open to thee this wound of living in the past with all my regrets about this abortion. I beg thee to bring thy son into this wound. Well, I beg thee to wash, cleanse, and purify this wound with thy tears and the precious blood of thy son. At communion, but we don't have to do it. We can do it right now. It doesn't have to be at communion. But at communion, I beg thee to bring thy son into this wound to heal it. I beg thee to fill the spot with charity, together with thy son, to stay in Rome. Especially powerful to pray around communion. One more time, we'll go on. Blessed Mother of God, I completely open to thee this wound of living in the past. With all my regrets about this abortion, I beg thee to wash, cleanse, and purify this wound with thy tears and the precious blood of thy son. I beg thee to bring thy son of this wound to heal it. I beg you to fill this spot with charity and to go with thy son to stay in Rome. Now one thing that's important to keep in mind that if someone's to ask for these kind of healings in the case of some horrific trauma, he shouldn't try to recall the circumstances. 
This isn't some psychological exercise. I'm not making fun of what the counselors do. I don't know what they do. It's not necessary, and it could even do more harm than good. He simply needs to ask Our Lady to bring the Lord into his woundness and pain and heal and make him free. Oftentimes, when they're doing this, previously unknown wounds will be revealed to the person. That's extremely common. Okay. So, that's the, the, the thing with the, with the uh, with living in the past. Briefly about the future. One typical approach taken by many people is to try to meticulously plan their future. We're supposed to take reasonable care for the future, but without worrying. If a man's worrying and planning in some meticulous way, it's indicative of a wound. He's not living in the present because he's the what ifs, what if that happens, what if this happens. He's dominated by fears that things won't go right, they won't go according to his planning, according to his wishes, according to his desires. If he'll be wounded again, or others won't accept him or like him because things didn't go smoothly according to his plan, etc. This is another thought pattern that's pleasing to Hill. Why? Because he gets caught up to, so caught up in trying to get the future according to his plan that he's not living in the present. This is key. It's essential. This present, this very moment, is the only moment we can grow in virtue. This present, this very moment, is the only moment we can heal. The present, the very moment, is the only moment we can gain an indulgence. The present, this very moment, is the only moment we can become holy. This present, this very moment, is the only moment in which we can become saints. Sometimes I hear people say, if only I had lived here or there during this time or that, if only I would known this saint or that, if only, if only. What the person, in effect, is saying when he says things like that is that God doesn't know what he's doing. Of course, that's blasphemy. What he's saying is, God doesn't know what he's doing. If only if I'd lived then or there, then I would have or could have him become a saint. God knew from all eternity that we'd be living right now. And God sure knew exactly what he's doing when he had it live now. The present is the only time to become a saint. He doesn't change at all. His power hasn't been limited at all. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's Hebrews 13.8. He will give us every necessary grace we need to become saints in the historical conditions in which he places us, if only we ask for them and live accordingly. Okay. So, we talk, so how will we go? We do the same kind of thing with that on the healing. I want to talk about forgiveness. I'm just going to run through some real typical things here that, to, to help guys, to give you some kind of outline. All right, there's much more that could be said, but we're just going to hit the main points. To be healed, we have to first be willing to forgive others. Our Lord explicitly tells us this in the Lord's Prayer. We have to forgive uh, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And that forgiveness can't be just a matter of lips. It has to come from the heart. It has to come from the will. We don't have to forget what happened. But we do have to forgive and let go. That's important. We don't have to forget what happened. But we do have to forgive and let go. Sometimes the hurt is too deep, too big. We don't actually know what's causing it. So we can't forgive or let go of it ourselves. It's so important to ask Our Lady and Our Lord to come into those areas to heal us Help us forgive and let go of the pain. We have to desire it. In the spiritual life, the will is paramount. We have to will to be healed with all our heart. Be willing to suffer whatever it takes. Okay? It's paramount to do that. Another way of thinking about the spiritual life is a spiritual journey of healing. From the disastrous condition we're in because of original actual sin to the transforming union for the great saints. But everybody should be headed in that direction. Okay, now, our Lord will help us with this. Sometimes we may actually have him do it for ourselves. I'll just briefly tell a story. I've told it elsewhere in more detail, but a young man uh, that had been subjected to torture, physical torture, emotional torture, sexual torture, unspeakable things since infancy. He grew up in a family of Satanists. He's tortured by his father and mother. He grew up in the family of Satanists. And yet, in spite of these unspeakable wounds, within about a year of starting to reach out in prayer to our Lord, that young man was able to totally forgive his parents. Now, that's not humanly possible. You don't need the priest to tell you that. How did he do that? He asked our Lord over and over again to come into those wounds, to heal him, to forgive his parents for him, and to help him forgive them and let go of all that pain. And over the course of time, our Lord did that. 
As we forgive others and ask others to forgive us of the wrong, it's important we try to repair any wrong we've done. If possible, we should make restitution. Not just because it's the just and lawful thing to do, but when we right a wrong, we're more easily able to forgive ourselves. We don't have as much guilt to heal from. The effort to right the wrong shows that we're truly sorry, that we want to be forgiven. We're at making acts the will to do that. Humbling ourselves and asking forgiveness shows the same thing. If we ask with a contrite heart that really wants forgiveness. It's really, really important to recognize with wounds of all sorts, especially the deep wounds, there's a need to forgive oneself. Even if we know it caused no, uh, we were not guilty at all, we did no wrong in causing the wound. That seems really strange to people when you tell them at first. With wounds of all sorts, especially deep wounds, there's a need to forgive oneself, even if we did no wrong in causing the wound. It's not that we're guilty, but there's a spirit of forgiveness needed where we can forgive ourselves and love ourselves and that hurt, realizing we can be loved in that wound. For example, if we were assaulted violently as a child, we would have built barriers and personalities around that wound so we could continue with life and, and deal with the pain and trauma. And uh, we might have to, as we start healing and forgive the attacker, we might have to need to forgive ourselves. Why? Because typically there's a certain amount of guilt and shame associated with these kind of wounds. In our brokenness, we tend to blame ourselves, like we did something to deserve it. This is very common when we're working with women that have had uh, violently abusive situations. They've been raped or molested or something like that. And somehow that little girl in her takes some kind of responsibility, even though there's nothing there. She has to learn to forgive herself. It's What does it do? They, they hold on to the pain like they deserve it in some way. It's our pain. It's our wound. No one else can really understand or feel the pain like I do, so it's mine. It will always be mine. I have to deal with it all by myself. I have to do it alone. It's my pain, and I have to deal with it. So we need to be able to, to let go of that, forgive everyone involved in the situation, let the wound be healed. How do we do it? The same way we did before. Blessed Mother of God, I completely open this wound to thee. I beg thee to wash, cleanse, and purify it with thy tears and the precious blood of thy Son. I beg thee to bring thy Son of this wound to heal it. I beg thee to fill this spot with charity, and together with thy Son to stay enrolled. Same way. It's also common if we suffered a great trauma, we get the idea we're dirty, we have no value. We may well, very well begin viewing ourselves like some animal or object. The results there are predicted catastrophic and obvious. I don't think I need to explain that. Another common example we're talking about, guys, here. Suppose somebody were a real party animal in his youth and later in life repented of being a rowdy. It actually can be pretty hard to be healed of this. One of the typical results of being a rowdy, of being a party animal, is a sort of perverse pride in that sinful way of life. A sort of perverse pride that he could drink and carry on with the best of them, etc. And because that perverse pride is associated with that wound, he may not want to let go of that prideful attitude, even though his sins hurt our Lord and Our Lady. And if he doesn't specifically want to let go of that pride, if he doesn't will it, he won't heal there. Because he actually can't heal there, because he's got some act of the will holding on to it. It may not be a fully conscious decision on his part. He must have an awareness of what he's doing. Typically, this isn't going to come from himself. A good confessor, a priest, a director, a good spiritual friend, or time in front of the Blessed Sacrament, time, mental prayer, and that will become obvious to him. A very, very important thing, again, is to pray to the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, to see myself as you see me, to love myself as you love me. You need that kind of light, huh? And beg for the graces, in this case, to completely reject that prideful attitude and the perverse personality traits that he, he put up, you know, that, that caused him to take pride in his disgraceful bear, behavior and sin. He needs to completely reject that because it hurts his relationship with God. It's a barrier between him and Christ. Another uh, common type of wound involves sins that someone fully chose to do, but then after the fact, he's very ashamed of. This is really common with certain types of sin that have a lot of shame attached to them. Cheating on a spouse, looking at porn, being involved in abortion, as we said, or a perverse lifestyle. Because of the shame, it's not uncommon for a guy to bury that stuff deep within himself. But in spite of that, uh, he sometimes has anger, depression, or whatever from the sin. Although he may have confessed it, he hasn't forgiven himself yet. He believes God could forgive him because he's God, but he can't forgive himself. And he's positive that others wouldn't forgive or accept him if they only knew what sort of things he'd done in his past. And so he tries to keep that thing stomped down in there. I mean, in the, on the woman's side of things, the country has millions and millions of women in this wounded condition. It's so common that we have a term for it. That's what being post abortal is. The simple and painful fact is that healing is impossible with buried wounds. We need to invite our Lord and our Lady in those areas, begging them to heal the sores, begging them 
to give us the grace to forgive ourselves, ask him to take the wound, all that pain away. You can picture yourself in mental prayer, handing the whole situation, pain and over, pain and all, over to our Lord, Our Lady. It's uh, also quite surprising enough, it's also pretty common in these kind of wounds for a severely wounded person to have a perverse sort of pride associated with it. What do we mean? They may very well think in so many words, I've hurt Jesus so very much that I can't burden him with this awful wound and pain that I created. It's mine, I did it, I caused it, so I deserve to carry it by myself. Again, here we are, not realizing that he's the Savior. In other words, I'm going to pay my debts. I can't really ask my Lord to pay this for me after all he's done for me. I'll deal with it. And after I get everything under control, then I'll go to him freely without burdening him again. Well, that once we see that, we can see it's a perverse kind of pride. To be fair, a lot of times the thought process hasn't been worked out that clearly, but the priest working with them or a good friend or whether in mental prayer, they can see that. Huh? We need to clearly see that if we were debt-free, then we'd have no need for a Savior. We all have debts we can't pay. We all have need for a Savior. And our Lord knows full well that we can't pay Him. What on earth does He need from us? Nothing. He's God. He's already got all. He doesn't need anything. So in spite of the fact that God needs nothing from us, in spite of the fact that God is perfectly content and happy in Himself, nevertheless the second person of the most blessed Trinity, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, still chose to pay our debts. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that made us whole. With his stripes, we are healed. One of the most important aspects of forgiveness is to not forgive, that we should make sure that we forgive God from the bottom of our hearts. Now that sounds crazy. It's certainly not because God has anything he needs to be forgiven for. That would be blasphemous to suggest. But oftentimes, when we've been seriously hurt, like a child that's been violently assaulted. They blame God. Why, if you love me, did you let this happen? You're God. You could have stopped it. Why didn't you protect me? I was too little to protect myself, and so on and so on. It's very common. In that sort of situation, there's a certain amount of blame that's been placed on God, and our hearts were wounded and disappointed because God was not our hero right then. He let us get hurt. He let us down, so to speak. That's certainly not the case. God was there. And he chose all those events, suffering with us, paying the price for that sin, and hurting for us much deeper than we'll ever know. It's roughly analogous to a mother seeing her child take a serious fall and get hurt. She feels the pain and suffering of a child, oh, in a different way. But she quite probably feels it even more than a child feels it. It breaks the mother's heart that it happened. We have a free will. It's an amazing gift. God doesn't want to take that away from us. But he can fix that hurt if we run to him. If we make an act will to give it to him fully, not holding anything back, he can and will fix it. He's God. He came to save sinners, take sin away. The key is to let him. To let him come in. We need to forgive him so that we can love him and trust him. We need to see that he didn't leave us. He's the only one that knows the hurt as we do. He, went, he knows what we went through, our pain, our guilt, our sorrow, that he was right there. The Satanist, that's what he had to do. The kid that grew up in the Satanist family, he had to invite our, our Lord was present and he had to ask our Lord, come in each one of those situations. I know you were there. Now I'm inviting you into me. I know you were standing there waiting to help me. Since our Lord's outside of time, he's coming into those different situations then, huh? When we're able to forgive, we let go of this huge weight. It's been holding us in bondage. We've been held in bondage by lack of forgiveness, but when we're able to start praying and inviting heaven into those wounds, the barriers are broken down. We're able to start forgiving, let go on the pain. We're being set free. The last aspect of this we'll touch on today, I'm just smoking through this quick, is the, the, the need to let others forgive us and to let God forgive us. Sometimes people won't accept forgiveness. For whatever reason, they hold other people's faults over their heads. They don't let them forget how they've hurt us. That grudge will actually prevent us from healing. When we don't let others forgive us, when we reject forgiveness, we're rejecting God in our lives. It's even worse when we won't approach the confession and let God heal and forgive us. We think the sin is too big or even worse. We don't want God's forgiveness. There's literally nothing that can be done there until we accept that forgiveness. Now, there's a lot more that can be said, but that should give each one of us a pretty decent overview of the various challenges if they've had a rough life. And even if you haven't had a rough life, you're not the Blessed Virgin. There's one more important topic we'll talk really quickly. 
Um, how do we know? What are my wounds? That's a spiritual question. Some wounds are going to be obvious if we violently assaulted a child that we had abortion. Many are not obvious. Again, we turn to Our Lady and we turn to the Holy Spirit and beg them. Holy Spirit, help me see myself as you see me and love myself as you love me. Blessed Mother, help me see myself as you see me and love myself as you love me. And over time, the less obvious problems will become apparent. This is really important. There's a lot of ways to be wounded and many different kinds of wounds. It can come from our families and be passed down almost like a family inheritance. In fact, in fact like family pride. There's good to have a healthy pride or love for one's family. But this sort of, there can be a, one that's not healthy, a sort of arrogance impressed into each member, or a spirit of harshness, and so forth, and so forth. So it's going to be easily wounded by loss of a parent, by being raised in a broken home, home without love, home full of violence, words and deeds, who've been abused physically, emotionally, etc. They can even rise in utero, in the womb. If the mother rejected the pregnancy, or even seriously considered aborting the child, if she even experienced a really serious trauma, as amazing as that sounds, the baby can experience rejection and need a healing from that. In both those cases, in inherited wounds and wounds in utero, the family needs to be forgiven from the heart. There's a lot more to be said that's sufficient to get you going on a process. A few more observations before we close. <clears throat> what I'm going to say now uh, might not apply to every soul that does this, although I suspect it does. But I just want to observe that over the past uh, decade or so, uh, that in the experience of the wounded souls that I've worked with, and this is a lot of what I do, the ones that are faithful to these kind of prayers, at a certain point in time, there's a major, for that person, sort of a miraculous inner healing. They're lifted by divine grace, as it were, from one place to like a plateau. And they're given this deep inner peace and a major healing. For the most part, it's not a complete healing. The souls that I've worked with are given a deep healing, a deep peace, but there's still areas to work on, areas which they still need to invite our Lord, to, our Lady, to bring our Lord in with His grace and light. Now, I believe, and again, this is my opinion. I believe that he, the healing progress is in this way for two basic reasons. And that experience of God's love it really lifts the burdens and the struggles and lets them know that they're loved in this area, that they can be loved, in spite of their wilderness and brokenness. They have an experiential knowledge. Of God's love. We just heard Che talk about it in a different circumstance. That experience of knowledge it transforms a man when that happens, huh? And in this place of woundedness, they have that. And secondly, it's not complete. So as to encourage them to continue to deepen and strengthen that relationship they have with Our Lady and Our Lord to make them true friends of the cross. Another important point. It's important to realize that if someone's asked these kinds of healings with horrific traumas, don't try to remember it. All those barriers are there for a reason. Just invite, open your whole soul to Our Lady and Our Lord and invite them to everything they see. You don't have to see it. It's not necessary. Heaven can see it. That's what you're doing. What you have to do is make acts of the will to open yourself to heaven. You don't have to sit there and have that kind of perspective. It's not necessary. One more point. When someone's trying to heal from those wounds and seriously praying, asking Our Lady to bring Our Lord into each and every one, it's very, very common in the experience of the people I've worked with that they'll get previously unknown wounds. They'll come to a knowledge of something they had no idea of. They start working on that, and that's the next place they, they, they go. A sad point now. The most important thing to do is make an act of the will that we really want to be healed and willing to suffer whatever it takes. I have had wounded souls that make great progress, I mean miraculous progress, have been given that deep inner peace and a major healing. But as usual, they've been left with some things to work on. I've had souls that, in spite of these incredible graces and gifts showered upon them, have chosen to turn back. God gives us free will and He won't ever take it away. He won't force us to be healed. He won't force us to forgive others. He won't force us to be saved. He won't force us to spend eternity in heaven with Him. Final point here. If anyone has these kind of wounds, wants to discuss them with a priest, it's essential that at least initially takes place in confession under the seal with a priest you trust. If you're going to show your wounds to somebody, be careful that it doesn't cause you to be more wounded. Okay, keep it under the seal. That way you have that kind of security. It's total privacy. And it's also you get the sacramental effects of the most precious blood pouring over those wounds. 
Don't bring it out of the confessional. Keep it under the seal. It's safe. It's anonymous. Over time, if there's a need, the wounded soul might discuss it in the external form. But all, if and only if you got a balanced priest and he's completely trustworthy, but don't start talking about those things just randomly outside. Be careful in the healing. You got to be careful how you show your wounds. This is especially powerful, as I said, in preparation for Thanksgiving for Holy Communion. You know, I don't know the prayers in, in the new Mass well enough to say. I suspect it's there, but I just don't know. But I know in, in the traditional Mass, the priest actually says a prayer for himself for healing every time before he gives himself communion. It's a, it's a third prayer before communion. It's called the Perchefsio. It contains the, the, the line, Through thy goodness may it, thy body, O Lord Jesus Christ, through thy goodness may it be unto me a safeguard and a healing remedy both of mind and soul. And everyone here knows the prayer before communion. Domini non sum dignus. Lord, I'm not worried that thou should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. There's a lot more that can be said, but that's all we have time for today. I'm going to cut it off. Unless you've reached the transforming union, each one of you here is at least somewhat wounded himself. Each one of you is one of the wounded broken sheep of the Lord. Today is the day to start working on this. If you don't have an intention for your Mass today, make it for your complete healing. It's a first Saturday, so you don't necessarily do it for your communion. But if intention, in general, if you don't have attention for Holy Communion, make it for healing. Pick a major wound, start on it. Today, don't wait. Let's get real. No matter when a man lives, he's going to be wounded. We're not talking about Our Lady. No matter when a man lives, he's going to be wounded. He will need a Savior. That does include Our Lady. He will need a Savior, and he will have a cross. But the man who wants to be a saint has to make a choice. He has to stop rejecting himself in the graces of God. He has to stop living in the past with his only if I had done this, only if I had done that. He has to stop saying, what if this happens or what if that happens? Someday that I'll work on my holiness. He has to choose to embrace his cross and God's love and virtue. Invite our Lord and our Lady into his life to help him, to heal him, to guide him to sanctity. He has to make up his mind to forgive, forgive others, forgive himself, forgive God, and accept forgiveness. He has to choose to live in the present. He has to choose to live in this very moment, the only moment that he can grow in virtue. He has to choose to live in this very moment, the only moment in which he can heal. He has to choose to live in this very moment, the only moment in which he can forgive. He has to choose to live in this very moment, the only moment in which he can gain an indulgence. He has to choose to live in this very moment, the only moment in which he can become holy, he has to choose to live in this very moment, the only moment in which we can become saints. He has to will it. He has to will it. And he can only will that in this present moment. The only moment that we can become saints. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that made us whole. With his stripes, we are healed. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.